I'm here to, let's pray. God, you know, I can do these talks by myself, but they sure are better when you do them. Holy Spirit, we turn this time over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. My wife and I on June 26 will have been married 40 years. And she says, we've had 33 good years of marriage. I'm not sure which seven she's referring to, but I did tell her the other day, if she leaves, I'm going with her. So that's how you keep it together, I guess. But we got married a bazillion years ago, and 20 minutes ago it feels like both. We were stupid. We didn't know anything about pre-marriage counseling or investigating the deeper things of life. We just got hitched and decided we're married. The preacher said, we're married. So we're married. That's it. And we moved to Nashville. We'd been in Knoxville at the University of Tennessee, and we left there and got a job. And so we went to Nashville and got a little one-bedroom apartment, and now we're a thing. We're a couple. We're there. It's official. And my wife gets up on Sunday morning about three weeks after we moved into the apartment and remembered that she was a Baptist. This was a detail we had not discussed prior to marriage. She knew what I was. I was a beer-drinking, hell-raising hillbilly. She knew what I was, and but this Jesus stuff and Baptist and church, and none of this came up until she gets up on Sunday morning and says, we're going to church. And I said, we aren't doing anything. It's Sunday. I'll be here drinking beer, watching football. This is what good rednecks do on Sunday. And she said, no, we're going to church now. We're in Nashville, which is the buckle of the Bible belt. There's more Baptists there than people. So she gets mad and not happy with me arguing and crying, and I'm not going. And she storms out of the house and didn't take her long to find her tribe because there's a Baptist church on every corner there. And she started going to this little Baptist church, and the little Baptist people on her would come down front and pray for her heathen husband on Sunday. And this went on for a while, and honestly, it wasn't going very good, y'all. And so was a rough start. And I got into this sales thing, and this beer-drinking buddy of mine, there's a lot of beer in his story, but this beer-drinking buddy of mine got me in this sales thing. We were going to get rich, you know, those things. And so we go to a sales conference, and we're sitting up in the back row of the sales conference, and Daryl and his other brother Daryl back there, and man, it was just two doofuses, and we, the guy got on stage that knew everything, that had the yacht, and he was making like $400,000 a minute or whatever, and we, you know, we wanted to be like him when we grew up. We were there to see him, and we had written down five questions. If we could get these five questions answered, we will be able to go be rich in the business. And that was all we needed. You know, this was our breakthrough, and we really wanted to hear this particular guy because he was the big dog that we wanted to be like. And so finally, he gets up at the end of the day, and it was as if he had our five questions as the outline for his talk. And he was a great speaker. I mean, he could hold the attention of a room. You know, he was a great orator. And he went through these five questions. And it's like, man, it's like he read our mail. We already wanted to be him, but then he ain't. But ding, 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 ding. I mean, if he'd have told us to buy a bag of dirt at the end of it, we would have. And he gets to the end of the talk. And he says, if you want to win in business, you want to become successful, I'll give you a tip. You need to know this man named Jesus because it'll change the way you treat other people. And people who are relational and put people first in business are always more successful. The givers in business are always more successful than the takers in business. You need to know this man named Jesus. Now, I look at my buddy and I'm like, has he been talking to my wife? He goes, I don't know, but maybe we ought to check it out. And I'm like, well, whatever. So we go back to the hotel room. And there's a Gideon's Bible in the nightstand. And of course, it's King James, Shakespeare, and Jesus. The chances of these two rednecks getting through this is zero. Okay? Not a chance. So we close that up, blind leading the blind. But we did go home. I told my wife, I said, we're going to church. And she said, who are you and what have you done with my husband? And we wander in the back door of this little church. And we went to a couple of them where they weren't having fun. And I couldn't imagine that if God was real, it wouldn't be fun. And some of these places looked like they were weaned on a pickle, but, you know. But if you're happy, you ought to notify your face. So we go in and we're sitting on... Sharon and I are sitting on the back row in this little church. Because, you know, when you're visiting churches, if it gets weird, you need to slip out, right? So we're sitting on the back row, checking this place out. And this is way back there, y'all. And back in those days... Everybody wore suit and tie to church, you know. And the only people that raised their hands in church were the weird churches, the crazy ones, you know. They were the only. 
Now, everybody's like, right. But, I mean, and we're sitting there, and this woman in the choir raises her hand like she knows the answer to some question. And then she's, like, swaying. And I'm like, uh-oh. And then here comes up a bunch of hands. And then hands are going up all over the place. I told Sharon, I said, if they get snakes out, I'm out of here. Well, they didn't. And they were sweet people. And the pastor was a strong guy, a good guy. And I kind of thought Christians were wimpy coming from my background on my side of the tracks. But this guy wasn't. He'd get up on you. He'd say stuff like, and it says in the Bible, this. And if you don't agree with that, you're what's known as wrong. There's a man right there. Look at that. I like that. And somebody take a stand on something instead of be a sheeple, you know? Oh my goodness. And gentle, kind guy, but very strong. And this is old days. There's about 400 people in this little church. In old days, people would stand. The pastor would stand at the back in a small church like that and shake your hand when you left. Meet everybody. And that way, if you're a visitor, you're trapped, right? And so, and they're back there shaking hands, and his wife's a big old squishy woman. She's giving big grandma hugs to everybody going out the door. That woman's hugs and that man's strength a few weeks later in my living room led me to accept Jesus as my Savior. It changed my everything. Not just my life, it changed my everything. And I do everything backwards. I met God on the way up. Most people meet him in a point of crisis, some kind of existential crisis, and they meet Jesus, you know, but I was just like, everything's going good except I need to know what this is. And so I started buying and selling real estate when we first got married. And by the time I was 26, I had about $4 million worth of real estate, starting from nothing, a little over a million dollar net worth, which translation means I had $3 million in debt. But at 24, 25, 26 years old, I made $250,000 cash taxable income. And this is in the early 80s. That was a lot of money then, $20,000 a month. Now, I don't know what neighborhood you grew up in, but we used to call that rich, and it was fun, too. Sometimes I hear these people say, all those rich people are miserable. Uh, uh, you got that car you always wanted, man. I always wanted me a Jaguar. I thought if I got me a Jaguar because the neighborhood I grew up in, they couldn't spell Jaguar. So I went and got me a Jaguar, man. Within 90 days, baby, I was a Jaguar. You know, it's like, right? You know, my wife likes those sparkly things. And so we got her some. They weren't big enough, so we got her some more, and we went to Hawaii, y'all. Rednecks in Hawaii. Oh, my goodness. Beautiful. I was going banana. We liked it so much. We went back, and we liked it that time. So we went back again. We were having fun, y'all fun. It was fun. We were having a blast. Now, I am not here to tell you money will make you happy. As a matter of fact, I am positive money will not make you happy. Money will make you more of what you are. If you're angry and you get money, Lord, help the people around you. If you're grace-filled and compassionate and you get money, it expands your ability to be grace-filled and compassionate. If you're generous and you get money, you become what we call a philanthropist. And you change entire ministries, entire communities, sometimes change the world with the money that God allows you to manage. But everything is expanded, magnified by wealth. That's why there's so many warnings about wealth in Scripture, because it's powerful, but it makes you more of what you already are. The crazy in your family gets crazier, and yes, there's crazy in every family. If you don't think there's crazy in your family, that means it's you. So we're going along pretty good and having a blast. And our bank that we were working with, we were buying houses and flipping this house before Chip and Joanna were born, and everything's going great. And the bank we were working with got sold to another bank. And a guy in another city looks down and says, there's a kid, 26 years old, owes us a million two and 90 day notes. Let's limit this relationship, which is banker talk for ruin his life. And they called our notes just like that. They had the ability to, because I'm an idiot. And I signed paperwork that allowed that. It's commercial paper, it's called. And yeah, they got, they can question the quality of the collateral, which is a subjective thing, and they just did it and called our notes. Short version of the story is we spent the next two and a half years of our life fighting to pay our bills because I was raised old school, that when you say you're going to do something, you do it. But it turns out if you're really stupid, you can't do what you said you were going to do. 
because you get put in a place where you can't do it no matter how hard you try. I worked like a maniac. I did everything I knew how to do. I was going crazy for two and a half years. And finally, at the bottom, we were foreclosed on. We were sued. And with a brand new baby and a toddler, we were bankrupt. We didn't get divorced. But money will cause a fight, won't it? I mean, we didn't get divorced. We held on to each other. But sometimes, just to get a better grip, y'all know what I mean? Sharon's from the hills of East Tennessee, frying pan throwing. There is an Olympic event, and the Russian judge says 10-2. Okay, yeah. Oh my gosh, man. Wow. I remember standing the shower so hot in my face, it was almost scalding. And I would just stand there and cry because I was so scared. I met God on the way up. I got to know him on the way down. He was my savior. But in that, I had an I surrender all moment. He became the Lord, the King of every area of my life because I suddenly realized I was completely inept. That I didn't know how to be a husband because I didn't. I didn't know how to be a man because I didn't. I didn't know how to be a daddy because I didn't. I didn't know how to handle money. Even though I have letters and licenses, all these things after my name that says, I'm supposed to know something about money, but I'm bankrupt at 28 years old. And so I opened the love letter from my Heavenly Father, who's crazy about me, and I said, this is the only way I'm going to do it. Because all the other stuff I've tried didn't work. So how are we going to be married? All right, submit yourselves one to another. Crud means I got to dry dishes. My kids are flipping through here, and they're like, Dad, what's this rod stuff? And I'm, come here, baby, I'll show you. First is going to be last. Hmm. Paradox. Interesting. And I started learning what the Word said about life and what the Word said about my relationship with my Savior and my King. It's a whole different way of looking at life. And all of a sudden, I was weird. Because Scripture says, Be not conformed to this world. Don't be normal. Be transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I started handling money. There's over 2,500 Scriptures on how to handle money. I started handling money this way. And you all know what's weird? It started working. Not fast, slow, painfully slow. But here I stand 30 some odd years later, and all I got to tell you is working is crazy working. And turns out if you plant corn, you will grow corn. Who knew? You're going to reap what you're going to sow every time. So here's five things you can do with money. Number one, you need to get on a written budget, a written plan. Now, I got 1,200 folks working on my team today at Ramsey, okay? And a whole bunch of them are little youngsters. They're amazingly smart. And I got socks older than them. And I have one of these little smart youngsters doing the stuff he's supposed to be doing. I went over to him. He was doing it wrong. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not how you do this. This is how you do this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I come back later and he's doing it wrong again. And I'm like, hey, hey, no, don't do it that way. Do it this way. This is the way you do it this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I come back again. He's doing it wrong again. I said, boy, we're going to set you free. In Jesus' name. I mean, how many times I'm going to tell you this? There's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. I'm right and you're wrong. Don't do it this way, okay? There's just some things that you don't know. And he looks at me and he says, but I'm not like you. And I said, okay, change. You don't have to be like me. But you got to do it like I'm talking about because I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. This is the way you handle this situation. This is what you do. And if you're not doing it right, what you do is you change. See, in Christianity, we have this concept called repentance. When you're doing something, when you're going the wrong way, God says, stop, change, go this way. Because you're about to run the car in a ditch. You're about to mess up your life. You're about to be broken, divorced, something. You're going the wrong way. And Christians, we throw sin around a lot. We can call it sin if you want to call it. We can just call it dumb if you want to call it. But I've been walking along dumb and God says, stop, turn, change. And we have the choice to listen to that or keep walking. We get to decide, are we going to change? Get on a budget. If you manage money for a company called You Incorporated, and you manage money for You Incorporated the way you manage money for you now, would you fire you? You know, I meet these Christians all the time, and I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. But some of them are oversaved, like they're praying for some dumb stuff. 
Have you ever seen that? Like, I meet a guy, he's like praying, 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 praying. I'm like, you know, you probably ought to go to work, too. You can pray on your way to work, because those that don't work don't eat. It's in there, too, right? And so let's get some work done, all right? And, you know, pray and pray and pray and pray, and I'm praying for more money. Well, why don't you handle the money that you have, right? First, if you're faithful in the little things, then God will give you more to manage. That's in the Bible, okay? And so don't be misbehaving and disorganizing, going, God sends you money. He will answer your prayer. He will say, no, it's in the parable of the talents. The guy who mishandled money not only didn't get more, but had it taken from him and given to those that did manage better. Do you see it in the Bible? Doesn't sound like wealth inequality. I don't. It's not. I'm not into that. This is the Bible. You mishandle money, it's devoid of common sense. To give you more, get on a written plan. My son, when he was 14 years old, decided he comes in, he's a car boy, like I'm a car guy. And he says, Daddy, I want a brand new Corvette when I turn 16. And I said, you want me to put you in a fiberglass body with a 465 HP that goes from 0 to 60 in 2.1 second. You will kill yourself and someone else. I have seen you drive. You are incompetent. No, I am a loving father. I will not give you so much power that it will destroy your life. Instead, you get an old Chevette with a tired gerbil under the wheel, under the hood down there. In the, Some of these cars sound like that too, don't they? But the ones that still make noise and oh my goodness. And you know, when you are faithful with the little things, my son, we'll talk about getting you into a better car. But most 16-year-old boys hit the car on all four sides within the first 12 months. Why are we going to put you in a brand new BMW? What do you think I am? Stupid. I, you know. No, I mean, I have judgment. This is God talking to you. Get on a written plan. My old friend Zig Ziglar used to say, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Have a plan. My friend John Maxwell says, a budget is people telling their money what to do instead of wondering where it went. The second one. And you knew Dave Ramsey was going to say this. Get out of debt. Avoid debt. The borrower is slave to the lender. Here's some math for you, okay? When you don't have any payments and you have an income, you have money. That was deep. When Sally Mae is not the ugly aunt in the spare bedroom. She's lived there so long you think she belongs when you have MasterCard in your life. Who named that anyway? The borrower's slave to the lender. But I got a card says, I know who the master is. Well, I only need one master in my life. I've already told you that I'm not going to live like that. If you don't have any payments, it's not very hard to build wealth. If you're working, you have an income coming in, and all of it's not going out anymore, mathematically speaking. I mean, the average car payment in America right now is $526 over 84 months, according to the National Auto Dealers Association. If you invest 526ers from age 35 to age 65 in a decent growth stock mutual fund and a Roth IRA, Instead of buying stupid cars with it, you'll have $5 million in that one account. Hope you like the car. Well, you suggest we drive junk cars? No, I suggest you pay for your cars or don't buy them. You can't afford it if you haven't bought it. You're weird. I know. I'd already told you. I'm not conformed to this world. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I quit taking a poll a long time ago. My fear of man dropped to zero when I went broke. It's all about one thing. What works? What doesn't? And what's Jesus say about it? Let's get after it. One thing. Let's do it. Get out of debt. And so we get our credit cards out at our house, and we go broke, and we get scissors out, and have a little candle ceremony, and we had a little placectomy at the house. What? Discover freedom. What's in your wallet? Capital One. Money. American distress. Home Depot takes cash. Chase this. You're weird. You're right. You're right. I am weird, and I'm not broke anymore. You mean you don't have a credit card? I hadn't had a credit card in 30 plus years to start with when I went, well, went through bankruptcy, they won't give you one. So, and then once I got where I could get one again, I had already decided I'm through borrowing money. I had changed. I don't borrow money anymore. You're weird. You don't have a credit card? Nope. That's my wallet. Green President's Faces and Good Redneck Emergency Fund. There's always at least 10 Benjamins in there. And so four pieces of plastic. A debit card, which means you have to have money in the account to use it. On my personal. A debit card on my business. 
my driver's license and my handgun carry permit. That's it. Oh, yeah. Rednecks in Florida, too, huh? Okay. All right, I said that in California the day I about got arrested, but good to be back in America, but yeah. So, hey, man, Tennessee and Florida, we're the same kind of folk. We just stand up and go, uh-uh. No, you ain't telling me what to do. You got confused somewhere. Uh-uh. Oh, my goodness. Even if it's right still. Uh-uh. Just because you said I had to do it. Uh-uh. No. So, get out of debt when you don't have any payments. You can fund your kid's college fund, and then they don't have debt when you don't have any payments. You have room to be generous. When you don't have any payments, you're set up to do the other things. The third one is foster. High-quality relationship. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. But the companions of fools will suffer harm. Why? Because you become who you hang around with. You read the same books they read. You binge the same shows on Netflix. You read the scriptures the way they read the scriptures. You become who you hang around with. Some of you came from the north, and it took you just a few years to learn about sweet tea, and properly speaking, but eventually you conform, and you become who you hang around with. Now, I'm not talking about, I have to have everybody around me. It's an echo chamber, and I can't have anybody in my life I don't disagree with. I don't mean that at all. I'll talk to anybody. I love people. I'll meet you where you are, but I'm talking about who I hang out with on my back porch. These are the men that are causing me to be who I am. And I need to select those carefully, intentionally, because my mouth is going to sound like their mouth. And some people I run into need to change their mouth. Next one is save and invest money. In the house of the wise are stores of choice, food, and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. If you spend everything you make, you're a fool. But if you save money, you're wise. That's what that proverb means. Proverbs is the book of wisdom. If you read Proverbs over and over and over again, and you understand the financial implications of the Proverbs, you will have a master's degree in finance beyond what a lot of people that have a master's degree in finance have. Because I got to thinking about it. Who was it taught me to borrow money? That was my finance professor in college who was broke. A broke finance professor is like a shop teacher with missing fingers. Let's think about this, right? If your broke brother-in-law has an opinion about money, his opinion don't count. He's just got an opinion, and he's broke. You've been married six times. I hope this one works for you. But I'm not reading your book on marriage. Okay, let's just... I mean, think about this, right? I'm going to find out what's going on here and line up with that. And so you save and invest. You save and invest. The first thing you save for is you save for emergencies. You save for what Grandma called a what? Rainy day. Rainy day. Visual aid. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Dave, you need to be positive. I'm positive it's going to rain. I don't think you're going to see another pandemic in your lifetime. I don't think you're going to see another group of terrorist fly jets into towers in a major city, America, in our lifetime. I don't think you're going to see a housing burst like we had in 2008 in your lifetime. But something else is coming. Something else is coming. I don't know where it is, but I just promise you I'm old. I've seen a lot of this stuff come and go. You have, too. And it comes and it goes, and something else is coming. You need to be ready. You need to be what we call the third pig. You remember the three little pigs? The first two didn't get real prepared, and the thing came, and a pandemic huffed and it puffed and it blew their house down and everything was gone. And what they did, they went running to their brother, who had actually taken more time and thoughtfulness and prepared for the future instead of YOLO. You only live once. Thank God it's Friday. Oh God, it's Monday. You know, instead, he actually had some maturity. Learning to delay pleasure. No. Discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it yields a harvest of righteousness. Scripture talks to us about this stuff all the time. Get ready. Be the third pig. It's coming. Be ready and see then this sets you up to be outrageously generous. Hard to be generous when you're broke. Have you noticed? Turns out the people that feed the starving kids are evil. Rich people. Only they're not evil. But the drumbeat out there in the marketplace and our toxic culture is that wealth is evil. Wealth is evil. Wealth is evil. Wealth is evil put at you by a kid living in his mother's basement with a $2,000 iPhone. And he's saying wealth is evil. Wealth is evil. Wealth is evil. 
Yeah. Well, let me help you with this. The percentage of people that are evil among poor people is approximately the same percentage of people that are evil among rich people. The money doesn't have anything to do with it. The money just makes you more of what you already were. Most wealthy people, and I know tens of thousands of them because of what I do, most wealthy people are incredible, generous, servant, kind, gentle, giving people. And then there's a few jerks. Most poor people are just trying to get ahead. They're trying to figure it out. They're not bad people. They're not evil because they're poor. They're just trying to figure it out. Man, I've been poor. I know what it feels like. Actually, I wasn't poor. I was just broke. Poor is, you're going to stay. I ain't staying. I'm going to move on through. Right? But here's the thing. I'm going to learn how to do this stuff. I'm going to be generous. See if you're on a plan. You get out of debt. You save money. You're hanging out with people of character and quality so that you're becoming a person of character and quality. The natural byproduct, you can't keep it from happening, is you're going to see a need and you're going to help somebody. You're going to look over there and a single mom is standing at the gas station filling up her gas and those tires are as bald as her baby's butt. And you're going to roll her over there to the discount tire store and put a set of tires on her car. And she will never know the name of her angel, but she'll smell the smell of God's spirit. Because when you encounter God's people and they do something practical like clothe and put shoes on people who don't have clothes and shoes, and they put tires on her car, and you feed a baby and you help a single mom get her degree so she can go make more money and support herself and be sustainable. The smell is the smell of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about y'all, but when I go to the grocery store, I don't go very much. Sharon does most of that. But I'm an efficiency person. I have no, I'm not going to the grocery store to hang out. I don't need to have a discussion. I'm in there to get this and this and this and get out the fastest. It's like a NASCAR stop, right? We're pulling into the pit stop. One, one, let's go. And so I go gather up my stuff. And as I'm moving up, you ever do this? You're moving up towards the front and you're looking at the lines, trying to see which one's the shortest and which one's the most efficient. And you're going, yeah, that one's short, but that girl looked like she's slow. And this girl over here, she's moving it, man. I'm going to get in this line, and I don't care. And then there's a lady with her buggy, like, looks like the Grinch that stole Christmas. I can't get in behind that one, right? So I got to find the efficient line and get out of there. So I'm over at the supermarket of the day, figuring out my line. And then after you do all that, it's still something to get screwed up, right? I should have been in that line it. Y'all ever do this? Am I the only one? I get in the line and this woman, her kids are running around all over the place and they're bouncing off the walls. I'm like, dad gum. Inmates are running the asylum and they're just out of control. Y'all see these people? Their children are just, oh man. It's like, and man. And then she puts her card up there and it's denied. And all of a sudden, all my self-righteous judgmental efficiency started draining. Now, I notice the kids, and it looks like their clothes are probably, well, they're experienced clothing, and you start to see how frantic she is. There's a lot of stress. I start to see on her body language, and then she turns, and boy, the eyes are the windows of the soul, the Bible says, and I look at her, and you can just see the pain and the fear and the anxiety, and she hands another card, and it's denied. And I'm just kind of watching this in slow-mo, like a wreck, like a train wreck. And I didn't realize it, but between me and her in line was Superman dressed as Clark Kent, was a Hispanic guy dressed in construction outfit. He's muddy. He's got muddy boots on and got his coat on. And before I could even come out of my self-righteous stupor, I'm just watching this whole thing. He comes out, pops out $300, and hands it to the cashier. Here goes Superman. The cape comes out, baby. And she's like, no, 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 he doesn't speak English, but you know what he speaks? Card. Tonight. We all know what that looks like and feels like. If you've ever been there, there's a shame. Everybody's looking, it feels like. It feels like how bad everything's going. It's right here in front of everybody. And he's like, no, no, no. And I look up, and the lady finally takes it. And after she turns around, tears run down her face. The cashier's crying. I'm crying. And the lady turns and gives the guy a big hug. I was going to give him a hug too, but that had been awkward. That's the highest and best use of money on the planet. It doesn't get any better than that. Generous people make us smile. Generous people make your eyes leak. 
So maybe we ought to be one. Maybe we ought to get on a budget and get out of debt. Build some wealth so that we are in a position to do that times a thousand. Just be walking around with God's money, holding it like this all the time. Okay, God, what are we doing today? What kind of fun are we going to have today? Because I got to tell you, you can go out to eat for $300 and have a really nice meal. And you should. You should do that too. Or you can do something like that and bail her out. I dare you to have that much fun for $300. That's a great spend right there. It's about as good as life gets. It wasn't even you that did it. And you feel better about you right now. Isn't that weird? Generosity is contagious. It gets in the air. It's electric. But you have to put yourself in a position to do it. If you're worried about paying your own light bill and you're so broke you can't pay attention and you're disorganized and confused and you're fighting with your spouse all the time about money, it's hard to look over and even see that woman in line because you're dealing with you all the time. It's time for a renaissance and the art of personal finance. It's time, America, for those of us in the church to change God. We thank you for this day. We thank you for these people, this wonderful place. We pray you prosper these folks beyond belief because they're the kind of people you can trust. Lord, they are worthy of your trust, trustworthy. And Father, you will see an explosion of giving, an explosion of generosity in this community because these are your people. That's how their hearts beat because they know they were given new life by you. They were transformed by you. And Father, you will get to just see a thing happen just because of this group this morning. Bless them, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.